So I'll hand over to Amelia now, who's going to um, host the webinar for us. So thank you, Amelia. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Sheree. And thanks to Begans and Becom for sharing this platform for us. That's very kind. Um, if you've just joined, you might like to um, put yourself on mute. And if you don't want to be recorded, just turn off your um, camera. So uh, we're going to start today with um, an introduction to myrtle rust by Bob Makinson. Bob is a conservation botanist and a plant taxonomist. He's the former ANPC president and current ANPC outreach delegate, and ANPC is the Australian Network for Plant Conservation. Bob is the lead author of the Myrtle Rust in Australia National Action Plan, and today he's going to give us some background information on myrtle rust and then lead us into a discussion about the critically endangered species native guava. So I'm going to share um, slides for Bob, so just bear with Go ahead, Bob. Good to go. Thanks, Amelia, and thanks, Sheree, for the opportunity to present to um, this audience. Um, my respects to the um, traditional owners and custodians of the various countries uh, on which we're uh, meeting today. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Darramurrigal land in northern Sydney, um, and Myrtle Rust, more than many other conservation issues in some ways, is um, really making us think about what it means to uh, be participants in custodianship uh, of uh, our natural heritage. Next slide, thanks, Amelia. Slide change. It's just taking a moment. OK. There we go. So, uh, yes, I'm with the Australian Network for Plant Conservation. I've been working on myrtle rust, um, mainly on the awareness and conservation implications side of things uh, since late 2010. Uh, the, uh, the rust only uh, was first detected in Australia in 2010. Um, and uh, one of the species that, um, uh, of course, has been crashing catastrophically here is native guava. I'll come back to these images later on. Next slide, please. So myrtle rust is a, uh, a fungal pathogen. Um, it's originated in South America and that's its centre of diversity. There's multiple strains in South America. Uh, some of those got into the Caribbean and North America between the uh, 1900s and the uh, uh, early 2000s. And uh, a particular strain known as the pandemic strain uh, sort of broke out into the Pacific region uh, from about 2005 onwards, uh, and as I say, was first detected in Australia in 2010. So in the Southwest Pacific, we only have this one strain of the pathogen so far, but there are other strains in South America and one odd one in South Africa, uh, which um, uh, could arrive here and do even more damage. Disease caused by um, Australopaxinia pazidii, the myrtle rust pathogen, is now recognised as a global biosecurity problem and a biodiversity conservation problem at the same scale. Um, and keeping the other variants out of Australia is a national biosecurity uh, priority, as recognised in the uh, EPL priority list, the website for which is uh, worth a look because uh, it will keep you awake at night worrying about some of the pests that are still to arrive in Australia. Next slide, please. Thank you. The current uh, distribution of myrtle rust in Australia is uh, basically the east coast, uh, largely east of the Great Escarpment, although in a couple of places uh, around Toowoomba and up on Atherton, it does get onto the tablelands and even occasionally uh, elsewhere on the tablelands. Uh, so seasonal um, outbreaks in Canberra are not unknown, usually in autumn. Uh, but um, for the most part on the East Coast, it is at relatively coastal altitudes. Um, it's also in the Northern Territory, just across the top end, very poorly um, um, recorded from up there. We, we don't have a lot of sites and species, but it's across the top end. 
and uh, it has just crept into Western Australia quite recently as well, just over the border in the Kimberley uh, region. Uh, it's present in Victoria and Tasmania, but only in cultivation so far as is known. That's often put down to climate, but I think it's probably just as much an effect of the fact there's um, many fewer highly susceptible species down there, at least as far as we know. Uh, and most of those are in cultivation, the ones that are highly susceptible. Uh, however, for whatever reason, um, it's, it hasn't jumped the fence as far as we know in those two states. It's not in Western Australia, apart from that one outbreak in the uh, uh, just over the Northern Territory border, but the southwest of Australia is in danger and is a major concern. Next slide, thank you. So uh, how murder rust kills, I'm illustrating this here with um, uh, photographs from another species, not native guava, but scrub turpentine, Rhodamnia rubescens, simply because there's a couple of nice photographs for this one that we haven't got uh, or didn't get early enough uh, for, um, for native guava. Uh, both of the species uh, are, were widespread prior to 2010. Uh, this one, scrub turpentine, occurs uh, from Naruma up into south southeast Queensland. Uh, it was very common. Uh, it's now in catastrophic decline over its entire range and has been listed as critically endangered uh, in the states of occurrence and at federal level. Um, and uh, it mostly survives now as shrub sized plants. Most of the big adults are dead, uh, as you can see at the far right there, and there's no reproduction from seed. Now, there's two things about motor rust that you've got to know, and these, these are part of what makes it different from most of the other threats that we, we face uh, to plant conservation in Australia. One is that it has a very lightweight uh, and very prolific airborne spores and they can get almost anywhere. So that map I showed you a moment ago of the East Coast distribution, mm. basically there are no really reliable refugia uh, along that East Coast strip. There are areas where uh, there is less disease because the microclimate is less favourable to the pathogen uh, or there's an absence of highly susceptible hosts. But uh, the spores blow around on the wind or get transported by humans or possibly flying, flying foxes as well and uh, can get pretty much anywhere within that zone. So refugia are not a feature of our, um, um, our strategy until you move right out of the myrtle rust zone altogether. The second thing is that myrtle rust is a really sneaky um, disease. It attacks new growth on plants. Um, it doesn't attack the old growth. So in the, um, well, the two photos at left show an old uh, pre-2010 uh, scrub turpentine, nice big healthy tree, flowers and fruits below that. Uh, but the, um, the in the centre panel, you'll see uh, the yellow pustules all over the leaves, uh, young leaves, and um, infecting those leaves and destroying their ability to do their job. And the um, uh, leafy branch with the dead stuff at the tip at the bottom of the screen is particularly illustrative of the way myrtle rust works. This was uh, a normal flowering branch in uh, 2010, uh, just after the disease arrived on the central coast of New South Wales. It went to put out its uh, normal seasonal terminal growth in December of 2010. That got clobbered by myrtle rust and died, and that's the uh, dark brown uh, shriveled leaf and the uh, subtending stem that you can see in that picture. Um, it had another go in uh, February, March 2011. Uh, and tried to put out a second flush of, uh, of uh, late summer growth. That in turn got clobbered by myrtle rust, and that's the light brown dead leaves that you can see, uh, and they're subtending stems. So the net effect on this branch, and indeed on the whole plant, uh, is that it put out no new growth that year. Um, those older leaves are unaffected by myrtle rust. We don't quite know the reasons yet why uh, young leaves are susceptible and old leaves aren't. Obviously something either phytochemical or uh, topological on, on the leaf surface um, and um, it can't put on any new growth and as those old leaves die off within a year or two you get an effect like the photo at right, total defoliation and an inability to refoliate. In addition myrtle rust can infect the uh, flowers of some species and the fruits of some species that's certainly the case with scrub turpentine and uh, basically there's uh, no seed, no recruitment and if um, seedlings do get through somehow, um, they, they're still likely also to get clobbered by myrtle rust very quickly. Next slide, please. 
So there's various scenarios. There's around about 350 species that uh, native species of Australian plants that are known to be susceptible to myrtle rust. Some of them are known only from inoculation experiments, but others are known in the wild or in cultivation as susceptible. Uh, but there are various scenarios. Scenarios one and two in the left-hand column uh, are obviously of less worry. Uh, scenario one is things like brush box, lofosteam and converter. Uh, which seems to be totally immune uh, to the um, to the disease. There's no recorded cases of myrtle rust completing its life cycle on brush box, uh, so no worries. Um, scenario two on the same left-hand column uh, is where things get hit, but at a relatively moderate level. We still ideally would need to know what's going on and how that's affecting the evolution and, and genetics of, of those species and their flowering flower set and fruit set. Uh, we haven't got the monitoring capability to be able to do that, but basically it's less of a worry than the other scenarios. The middle column is the species with variable susceptibility and therefore variable rates of decline. Um, that indicates that there are some uh, rust tolerant genotypes present. Um, the decline may be severe in some populations or um, it may be relatively moderate. Melaleuca quinquinervia, uh, one of the broadleaf paperbarks, is a good case in point. I'll return to that one a bit later on. But again, we need to know, and we don't yet have the resources to do this properly, uh, we need to uh, track declines and the natural selection that's going on as a result of metal rust impact. We know that flowering has been significantly affected. Melaleuca quinquinervia and those familiar with the species will know that it's a mass flower and quite important for a whole bunch of uh, fauna. Scenario four is the one we're dealing with with native guava. Uh, this is a species with extreme susceptibility, uh, no tolerant genotypes, or at least if they do exist, they're very rare uh, and very rapid in the catastrophic decline. Um, and the management options uh, for these within our current resources are to salvage germplasm as quickly as possible. There's no seed being produced, so we can't capture seed very easily. We have to capture it vegetatively. Um, get it into protected cultivation and look for resistance traits that perhaps can be bred back into wild genotypes uh, for reintroduction later on. Thank you, Amelia. Um, so, um, native guava has gone from common to critically endangered very quickly. I've, I've probably dealt with this adequately already, but basically the two shots at left here are back in 2010 near ground zero on the central coast. Uh, sucker growth getting hit and uh, late flowers, early fruits getting hit very badly. And by year four up on the um, uh, north coast of New South Wales at Bongle Bongle, uh, we had uh, big adult trees uh, totally defoliated and with no capacity to put growth back on. There are isolated individuals, as with the shot at centre bottom, uh, of reasonable sized plants still surviving. Um, that is still the case, but they are very rare. And it's hard often to tell whether they are genuinely resistant to the rust or have just escaped uh, due to local climatic or overall uh, weather conditions. Um, by 2019, even on the uh, north coast of New South Wales, um, things were reduced to the situation you see in the three shots at right. Uh, basically standing and fallen trunks. They've got quite a distinctive bark, so you can still tell where the poor buggers were. Um, but um, the root systems of native guava, unlike some of the other um, host species, uh, the root systems hang on and they push up these little uh, suckers every year, annual suckers. That seems to be getting just enough photosynthesis back into the root system that it can do it again next year, but they get hit by myrtle rust quite quickly and die back. They don't usually get to more than a metre in height. Um, I'll leave that for now. I'm running behind time, I think, so we'll move on. Thank you, Amelia. The germplasm uh, that we've been capturing on an emergency basis is propagated in the usual sorts of ways. As I say, it's vegetative uh, to begin with. Uh, because there is no fruit set in the wild. Um, we can take ordinary cuttings off the suckers and the propagation rate uh, is quite good if they're taken at the right time of year. Uh, but we can also take whole sucker units, although we've got to be aware that that then disrupts the surviving root system. And those sucker units are very robust and very good propagation units. 
the um, species is uh, precocious in cultivation, very fast to establish and grow. Um, you can see a shot there of it flowering uh, in year two uh, post propagation. Uh, this is good for um, uh, looking at uh, things like, um, uh, well, for seed production possibilities down the track. Uh, the seed is difficult to store, uh, like many of the uh, soft fruited rainforest uh, myrtaceae. So, um, um, both for that reason and because we need standing arrays of plants for screening purposes uh, to look for resistance traits, uh, whole plant live collections are going to be a feature for quite a while. Next slide. The long term vision, uh, this diagram is taken from the New South Wales Saving Our Species Operational Plan for Native Guava. Uh, the uh, two top uh, boxes in brown are to do with uh, the emergency sampling uh, of wild germplasm uh, because we don't want to just wind up with you know one genotype. Uh, we've got to preserve fidelity to the original uh, range of variation if we're going to be putting stuff back into the wild eventually reinforced. Uh, and we're dispersing uh, that meta collection uh, to multiple institutions uh, for security reasons. We don't want all the eggs in one basket in case of catastrophe. After the last few years, I think we're all aware of the potential for catastrophic events. Um, level two here is um, the blue boxes. Um, we still have to secure really uh, sustained resources for a screening and breeding program. And we have to look at the ecological, cultural and ethical issues around uh, breeding, selection and reintroduction as well. But all those things revolve around this safe custody ex situ collection, the meta collection in safe custody, um, which uh, really is all that's going to be left of the species within a very few years, like five to 15 years, no more. Uh, from there, we can screen, uh, we can breed for resistance, and we can either reinforce surviving populations or reintroduce into the wild. Now, this is where the blue sky stuff comes in, and the critical question is, well, how feasible is this to breed resistance back in and, and, and rewild plants? Uh, is this too manipulative? Well, it's an interventionist, highly interventionist uh, conservation step, but it's the only one we've got. Uh, to beat extinction for this species. And if we can go to the next slide, it is actually quite realistic because in South America, where one strain of this rust is known as eucalyptus rust, it's known as that because it's been attacking eucalypts in plantation over there uh, for a number of decades now. And the eucalypt industry in uh, South America is huge and got a lot of money and they have been breeding for resistance to that particular strain uh, four decades quite successfully. Um, there is limited work on the same sort of front going on in New South, uh, sorry, in Australia with um, lemon myrtle, which of course is a bit of a niche crop for oil and uh, and leaf, and uh, that too is is showing capabilities for some uh, provenances um, to uh, uh, produce both an acceptable yield of, of product and to uh, show greater resistance to myrtle rust. But those two areas have advantages that we don't have in the conservation area. One of those is that uh, we don't have the kind of commercial imperatives and investment uh, possibilities that primary industries have. And that's been a major problem for, for a decade now. Uh, and the second is that we've got to avoid genetic bottlenecking. We're not interested in clones in the way that the South American foresters are or that a lemon myrtle producer might be. We're interested in reinforcing a wide range of wild genotypes for redeployment into the wild. And some species give a better possibility of this than others. So Melaleuca quinquinervia in the bar chart there, that shows uh, resistance of seedlings to myrtle rust in different populations. And you'll see resistance rates from less than 10% up to about 80% plus. Uh, in different populations up and down the east coast of Australia, that indicates there's a good genetic basis for selection of resistant genotypes there. Making sure that they're robust over multi-generations and that they're heritable from one generation to another is another issue. It's, it's going to be a long process, not a quick one. Next slide. There's a national action plan which has been involved by the Myrtle Rust Community of Concern. Um, it's uh, not uh, endorsed in toto by government as yet, although the feds are working on adapting it into a threat abatement plan, uh, which is their preferred instrument. 
um, and elements of it have been taken up by various research bodies and by uh, some state governments uh, as well. So it is having an effect, uh, even though it's not a formal government plan at this point. Uh, you can download that from the um, Australian Plant Biosecurity Science Foundation website or the ANPC. It's worth also having a look at what's happening in New Zealand, which has been very active on myrtle rust. They've only got 30 species of, myr of um, myrtaceae as opposed to our um, 2,200 odd, uh, and they've only had it since 2017. But they, um, they've thrown about $40 million at it uh, to date and have a pretty comprehensive uh, response program underway. And it's worth contrasting also, of course, with agricultural diseases. So horse flu back in uh, the 2000s uh, got 110 million bucks with no questions asked, um, whereas environmental threats of this sort tend not to. Next slide. Now, the remaining slides I'm not going to go into, uh, they're for you to um, look at in the PowerPoint version of this presentation, which will be available after the uh, after the webinar. Uh, there's a number of slides tacked onto the end of what I've just given, uh, which cover key facts about motor rust, uh, some of the uh, sort of control possibilities, the potential in Western Australia, uh, ANPC's response to myrtle rust and some key references and resources uh, that might be of use to people. So I'm sorry I've gone over time, but uh, that's my lot. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Bob. And um, really generous of you to um, share that information, which will be available um, to people later. So um, we're now going to look at the safe custody for native guava project in particular, um, securing um, those populations of Rotomurda sidioides that Bob was speaking about. And we were really fortunate in this um, project to have grant funding to create a short video. So um, Rebecca, if you're able to share that now, that would be fantastic. I will do my best. Can everybody see that screen? Yep. Yep. All oh, good. Okay. I will click go. I have been studying Australian plants for about 40 years. I've never seen a disease move as fast as myrtle rust in the plant world. looking at here is uh, an old dead adult Rotomyrtus, Cisidioides native guava. And from being a common tree of coastal rainforest, this species is now critically endangered just as a result of that one disease in 12 years. And nowadays, most of these populations survive just as suckers, which are still coming up from the old root system before murder rust knocks them down again. So a species can't survive like this. One of the things that is happening is we're urgently collecting live sample material from the populations that remain in the wild because they're going to be gone before long. And we also score the health of the plant that uh, we're, we're taking it from. That's because we're still trying to build up a picture of how the disease acts in the environment. And we're also trying to detect any uh, plants which might be unusually resistant to the disease. And what we're doing then is taking them into protected growing conditions where we can study the disease study how the plant reacts to the disease. The ex situ collection provides the material for the scientists to trial different methods to see if there's any innate resistance within the species. That's important because then we can use those resistant genotypes to reinforce the natural populations and hopefully be able to come up with something that will survive in the wild. A national myrtle rust response really requires um, an effort from a whole bunch of different science and horticulture uh, levels of expertise. Botanic gardens, both metropolitan and regional ones, are proving to be a really important part of a network uh, of institutions that can hold parts of that collection.
should myrtle rust uh, break out at any one institution, it can be controlled with fungicide, but we don't want to risk everything in one place. One of the biggest contributions that community groups and land care groups can make is keeping track of which species that are most severely affected by myrtle rust still survive in their areas and where they are. And also perhaps in identifying uh, individual plants or populations that may be more resistant to the rust. We're very much hoping that this uh, native guava project will be a model for how we might deal with some of the other myrtle rust affected species but also how we might be more prepared for other incoming uh, environmental pests and diseases in the future. Thanks so much for sharing that, Rebecca, and well done to everyone in the project committee. I'd also like to acknowledge um, our producer for that video, um, Chantel Doyle, who's worked with AMPC in the past, and also the videographer, Michael Lawrence-Taylor, who's done a great job on that video. So um, as the project manager for this um, Safe Custody for Native Guava project, um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the project activities and the range of partners involved. So um, just bear with me while I um, get this presentation on the screen. And please, if you have any questions for um, Bob, do put those um, in the chat and um, he can answer them shortly. Okay, how's that? That's good. Oh, good. Thanks. Good. For... Okay, so um, my name is Amelia Martin Jensen, and as I mentioned, I'm the project manager um, for this particular project at the Australian Network for Plant Conservation. Um, before I get into the details, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I live and work, the Darug and the Darawal people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I'd also like to extend that respect to the First Nations people in all areas of country that we're working on during this project. Um, this is a project that has been funded by the Australian Government for about 12 months and it involves the establishment of dispersed collections, which are sometimes known as meta collections, across New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT and also nursery collection in Queensland. As Bob mentioned, for species such as native guava, meta collections provide a duplicate or a backup at other locations in a similar way to the backup of wild source seed collections at the Millennium Seed Bank or agricultural seed collections at the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. It's essentially creating an insurance population for this species. The funding through this project also meant that we could coordinate actions around propagation, monitoring and genetic analysis. For species in rapid decline, such as native guava, this ex situ conservation away from the natural habitat may be the only way that we can safely preserve genetic variation. The current project helps meet the objective of germplasm capture, which is a really high priority, a very high priority in the National Action Plan. Germplasm just means any plant material that can be used to produce new plants. Um, this um, this species, native guava, is not often setting seed in the wild anymore, so we rely on collections of cuttings or suckers. Um, without this material, there are no future options for species preservation or recovery because there may be no plants left in the wild. So for species in uh, rapid decline like this native guava, the next five to ten years really is critical. Our collaboration with Craig Sten at the New South Wales Saving Our Species Program of DPE um, ha means that a collection of cuttings and suckers has been built up in collaboration with the Australian Botanic Garden Mount Annan since 2015, and this is ongoing. If you'd like to hear more about the work of, the, um, of Craig Sten and the Saving Our Species team in New South Wales, he presented a fantastic webinar this morning in New Zealand's Beyond Myrtle Rust webinar series. Um, so that will be available um, for viewing as a recording shortly. The current project here meant that we could extend the sampling and genetic analysis um, from New South Wales into Queensland populations and to establish ex situ population at the Department of Agriculture and Forestry Nursery in Gympie. 
Our partners there and at Mount Annan have been establishing these new ex situ collections and those collections provide a source of future propagation material, an accessible collection for research and a way of distributing germplasm across partner organisations as a further measure to establish the species in safe custody. That means there's material available to establish tissue culture collections and to screen for resistance as Bob was speaking about. The native guava plants in our current project have been studied by Stephanie Chen, um, Jason Bragg and the Research Centre for Ecosystem Resilience to understand their genetic diversity. And the good news is that the ex situ populations in the nursery at Mount Annan adequately capture the diversity present in those New South Wales wild populations. A similar analysis is now underway for germplasm sampled in Queensland. Using this genetic information helps us send each partner garden a set of plants that is unrelated and they're genetically diverse. So these precious plants have a good chance of producing seeds, which can be collected for future research or management activities. Expert horticultural input really is key to the successful propagation, maintenance and dispersal of collections to other botanic gardens. You can read a case study about establishing these ex situ native guava collections using the QR code link to the germplasm guidelines on screen. The care required for these collections is even more intensive than your average horticultural collection because we can't risk loss of any plants and particular care needs to be taken to maintain watering, hygiene and monitor and respond to pests and diseases including myrtle rust. Um, some people like to call this extreme horticulture. In spring last year, our partner gardens received their first plants to add to their own living collections. Five advanced Rhodomurda cityoides plants were sent from the Australian Botanic Garden Mount Annan to the Lismore Rainforest Botanic Garden, the Blue Mountains Botanic Garden Mount Toma, the Australian National Botanic Garden and Dandenong Ranges Botanic Garden. And plants were also added to the existing in-ground collection at Mount Annan. Recently, a further 10 plants were sent to each partner garden, so there are 15 new plants at each of five locations in total. Plants sent to the Australian Botanic Garden and the Lismore Rainforest Botanic Garden um, supplement their existing collections of Rhodomyrtus and add diversity to their living collections. And you'll hear from um, Peter at the Lismore Rainforest Botanic Gardens and Zoe at the Australian National Botanic Garden shortly. Um, plants are maintained in each partner garden with the usual irrigation, caging and spraying as required, all the regular kind of plant maintenance activities. The plants ex situ and in situ are monitored to look at the incidence and severity of myrtle rust symptoms, as well as flowering and fruiting. The plants in the botanic gardens are also monitored for their early growth. This helps us build up a bigger picture of the plant and disease interaction and also helps flag opportunities for further research. To sum up this project, we've had an opportunity to revisit populations in rapid decline and collect germplasm, as well as to understand the genetic diversity now held in botanic gardens and the DAF nursery. We've then sent um, our partners in multiple locations, a diverse set of plants to manage that risk of holding collections at only one site. These collections are available for future research and recovery efforts and that also um, mitigate, mitigate against the risk of extinction in the wild. With appropriate resources, these plantings can be managed collectively into the future as a meta collection um, and hopefully they will also produce enough viable seeds so that researchers can work out which storage conditions are best because rhodomyrta seeds are not suitable for freezing in the usual manager in the usual manner. Um, this pilot project is a model for germplasm capture of other emergency priority species um, because there are other species uh, similarly in rapid decline that's consistent with the National Action Plan and also the Commonwealth Threatened Species Action Plan to 2032. I'd like to say a big thank you to all our project partners. It's been a great group and we've been able to achieve quite a bit working together over only a short period of time. And now you'll hear from two of our um, project partners. And Rebecca, if you're able to um, share that second video link, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Can you all see that? Yep. Yeah, um, so you're going to hear first from Peter Gould. He's the curator at Lismore Rainforest Botanic Garden. 
me start it again. Okay. Botanic gardens are not merely ornamental places. They are dedicated to the scientific collection of plants and our role is to educate people about the possibilities of saving that diversity and also to enhance the natural environment. My name is Peter Gould and I'm the curator at the Lismore Rainforest Botanic Gardens. The Botanic Gardens is entirely run by volunteers, apart from one person from council, and we specialise in growing rainforest plants that are endemic to the immediate area around Lismore. The native guava, Rhodomertus sidioides, was reasonably common around Lismore, but currently it can't possibly survive on its own in the wild because of the impact of myrtle rust. So it was a natural step for us to be involved in this project. We have a number of plants that have been collected through the New South Wales Save Our Species program. The setup of this conservation collection was clearly outlined. They've been planted out in a specific area to try and prevent transfer of myrtle rust and put in leaky tape irrigation. We're constantly having to spray with fungicides to try and control the myrtle rust. And we're already beginning to notice that some plants are more resilient than others. The main challenges with this sort of collection is ensuring that we really have sufficient knowledge. We have to consider the possibility of spreading myrtle rust. There's potential for frost, insect problems, and our infrastructure is very basic compared with other botanic gardens. There is a huge amount to be gained by regional botanic gardens being involved in these sort of programs. Whenever we apply for funding, we are able to say we're involved in serious scientific work and have the backing of these people who regard us as a credible institution. Informing our volunteers of the nature of what we're doing here has been a central part of our success. It shows that their efforts have really contributed to overcoming a really major national ecological issue. Congratulations to Peter and Damien and all the volunteers there at Lismore Rainforest Botanic Garden. I think that's a really inspiring example of how people can uh, work together in this collaborative way, even in the, the face of such a sobering threat as, as we are facing with myrtle rust. Um, so now I'm going to invite uh, one of our other project partners to come on screen, um, Zoe Knapp, um, if you'd like to pop your camera on. Our, um, Dr Zoe Knapp is the Conservation Manager at the Australian National Botanic Gardens. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Zoe. Um, can you tell us a bit about the benefits um, for you in quite a different situation to um, Peter at Lismore, um, the benefits of working on this kind of collaborative project? Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation, Amelia. Um, so that for those who might not be familiar, the Australian National Botanic Gardens here in Canberra, which is on Ngunnawal country, um, is has a focus on showcasing Australian native flora and we have over 6,000 taxa represented in our collections. So we're really grateful to be involved in a project that aligns so closely with our organisational values and objectives in that um, it achieves the conservation research and education about our native flora. Um, but actually, in addition, there were some really amazing practical benefits that I've seen through this project. And those things include hands-on experience with new digital technologies for data collection. So using the EpiCollect app has been a wonderful example of the types of, of um, digital applications for things like this. And it's broadened our thinking about how we might use that type of technology. Um, it's also given us an opportunity to connect and train our horticulture staff in monitoring myrtle rust across our collections. And I'm grateful for the amazing training documents that were uh, prepared as part of this project and shared with the partner gardens. 
and also um, to demonstrate to all our staff the the uh, ability to use our living collections in scientific research as well. Um, but I think most importantly, we value the opportunity to work collaboratively um, and strengthen our connections with other botanic gardens and with the Australian Network for Plant Conservation. We love to learn from other botanic gardens about the approaches that they're taking and, and you know, for example, the inspiration from the video that we've just seen in Peter's incredible volunteer program and what they achieve and just the different contexts that we're all working in and the similarities in the approaches that we're taking. Um, and I think just finally, it's important to stress in, in regards to that collaboration um, that the success of projects like this really lie in their collaborative effort and um, in us having a shared understanding of the science and an agreed approach forward. It's imperative that we work together um, and not in isolation if we want to get this right. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Zoe. And um, yeah, I, I echo that. I've learned a lot um, myself um, about murder rust. And I think that's true. Um, all our project committee um, came in with different levels of experience in identifying um, myrtle rust and looking after plants affected by myrtle rust. And I think being able to work together um, provides a lot of benefits for for um, all the partners involved. Thanks so much. So we're going to change our focus now um, to the big picture and talk about all the different Myrtaceae collections held in Botanic Gardens and introduce our final speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bradley Desmond, who is the Acting National Coordinator of the Australian Seed Bank Partnership. Australia's National Alliance of Conservation Seed Banks. Bradley facilitates collaborative seed banking, research and knowledge sharing, knowledge sharing initiatives on behalf of the partnership, as well as the Council of Heads of Botanic Gardens, sometimes abbreviated to CHARBAG. To understand the ex situ representation of the myrtle rust affected Mertesi collections, Charbag and the GANs undertook the first countrywide stock take of insurance populations late last year. And Bradley's online today to share the results of this important survey. Over to you, Brad. Beautiful. Thank you, Amelia. I'll just share my presentation. Beautiful, there we go. Um, hi everyone, uh, it's great to be here and great to be part of this webinar. Um, as Amelia said, I'm Brad Desmond, I'm the Acting National Coordinator of the Australian Seed Bank Partnership. Before I get uh, into the, uh, the, the details of my presentation, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where I'm presenting here today in Canberra, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So I'm here today on behalf of Charbag and Big Ants to talk about how we're helping to fight myrtle rust um, using uh, Australia's ex situ collections data. So as you'll um, now know from Bob's sobering presentation, um, myrtle rust was introduced into Australia in 2010 and it spread up the uh, east coast along the top end into Northern Territory and it's moved uh, slowly into WA now. It attacks new growth of over 350 iconic Australian Matesi species, including things like eucalypts, bottle brushes and tea trees. Seedlings are particularly vulnerable and repeated infection of adult plants can lead to defoliation, loss of reproductive capacity and eventual death of that plant. Susceptible species and ecosystems are already in decline from this threat and without action, it's only expected to worsen. So what's being done about it? Well, work's currently underway across the country uh, and it includes things like research to determine how wide ranging the impacts are, uh, work to prevent new strains from entering the country through biosecurity measures and conservation activities such as securing insurance collections of plants away from their natural habitats where myrtle rust is having that impact. And that includes um, plants in botanic gardens, seed banks, arboreta and other um, like-minded facilities. And that last point is why I'm here today. Um, so species that are secured in ex situ or off-site collections have really important databases that contain some crucial information. And Charbag and Began sought that information to create the first countrywide stock take of Matesi insurance populations. And that's to see how many species we're currently working on and where our gaps are for future conservation work. So with biosecurity funding provided by the Australian government, we worked with experts across uh, academia, botanic gardens, seed banks, in order to develop a survey that can capture that information about the off-site Mertesi collections. 
This survey ran for the last few months of 2022. There were three general parts to the survey. So the first part um, asked general information about organisations as well as their experience with Myrtle Rust. Uh, part two sought information about collections of high priority Myrtaceae species and part three sought information about other Myrtaceae collections that uh, might be held. And I'm here to share the preliminary results of that survey with you today. But before I do, I want to say a huge thank you to the Charbag and Vegans Gardens, as well as the staff of all the facilities uh, who took part in the survey and took time to, to give that information because it's it's amazing that we have all of that and it's great to finally share share some of that information. So moving into the results, we had uh, 29 facilities provide their data to us, and that included institutions from, uh, sorry, uh, at least one institution from every Australian state and territory, as well as institutions in New Zealand and in the UK that hold Australian Mertesi collections. We received over 40,000 rows of data, which uh, Damien Wrigley, uh, my predecessor, has been analysing over the last few months. So thank you, Damien. <laughs> So jumping into the outcomes of part one um, of the survey, we uh, asked inst institutions if they'd observed metal rust close to their facilities. Just under half indicated that they've observed it within uh, five kilometres of their boundary. Um, and when the results of the survey are more finalised, we hope to produce a bit of a heat map to show where those locations are. Pleasingly, most facilities are actively monitoring for metal rust, either inside or outside their facility. And that provides hope in that they could respond rapidly, rapidly to treat um, collections if metal rust is detected and if they have the resources to do so. Of the 29 facilities that provided data, only five indicated that they're actively treating their collections for metal rust. Um, however, there's some evidence to suggest that that number is increasing uh, given recent projects like the native guava project that Amelia just mentioned. Um, that's provided facilities with myrtle rust affected species that will require more active management. Just under half the facilities that responded indicated that they were receiving some funds to support additional collecting in the future, which is really positive news. And we also asked if institutions are part of the Plant Sentinel Network. So for those of you who may not be aware, uh, the network's a global initiative uh, where member institutions provide information about incursions of pathogens and pests as kind of an early warning system to recognise new risks. And just under half of the respondents indicated that they're part of the network. So there's some, some work to do to get more facilities involved in that, especially when it comes to myrtle rust. So moving on to part two of the survey. So as Bob said, in 2020, the Myrtle Rust Action Plan, plan was published and it named um, some priority species and them, uh, placed them into categories to indicate the level of risk that Myrtle Rust presents to their survival in the wild. And these categories were emergency, very high and medium. From data from the survey, we know that a large proportion of these priority species uh, are represented in insurance populations. Four out of five of the emergency species are represented all 11 of the very high species uh, are represented, 23 of the 27 medium species are represented, and all of the World Heritage Area flagship species are represented. And these include species from Lord Howe Island, which as you may know, has recently reported an incursion of metal rust. Unfortunately, the priority species listed uh, on screen at the moment were not present in any of the facilities that responded. That's not to say that there aren't uh, some that are in insurance populations, they just weren't reported as part of the survey. Um, and while it's concerning, this information provides some valuable um, data about where ex situ conservation efforts might be required in the future. If we look at all of the information provided in the survey, we found that of the 2,735 Mertesi taxa that are described in the Australian Plant Census or the APC, um, over Just over 2,000 of these are currently held in ex situ conservations across the 29 institutions. Um, this represents nearly 75% of the described taxa in the Mertesi family, which is a really great start. But it also highlights that there's work to be done to make sure that the remaining 25% are captured in ex situ collections in the coming years. And that's not to mention the other species that are still yet to be described or just not accepted in the APC just yet. We also wanted our survey to align with the Australian Government's Threatened Species Strategy Action Plan, or TSAP. 
Um, the plan includes a list of 30 priority native plants that will be the focus of recovery actions from the Australian government from 21 to 26. Of these priority 30 plant species, uh, four of the former Tasey species are included, and thankfully data about all four were captured through this survey. On the left, you can see the accession source for each of the four priority species from the TSAP. And on the right, you can see how many facilities have material for these four species. And we can see here that uh, Rhodomertus cityoides is the, has the largest number of accessions um, and it's present in the most number of facilities. And hopefully we'll have a bit more of a breakdown for, for other species as we finalise the results from the, the survey. Before I finish up, I just wanted to quickly touch on a few other preliminary results. So interestingly, um, the earliest Metasi collection from our respondents was made in 1905, which is pretty amazing. Um, we discovered that over 13,000 accessions are held as living plant collections across all of them, and we have over 8,000 accessions in seed collections. Uh, it was also reported as part of the survey that accessions for two species were collected as they're suspected to have some form of metal rust resistance, though this is yet to be confirmed by a further study. So what's next? Um, so after some further analysis, we'll be producing a final report to answer all the questions posed from the survey. Um, this report and the data will be provided to the Myrtle Rust Expert Working Group to help inform scoping of a potential threat abatement plan for Myrtle Rust. Information will also support the implementation of the Australian Government's uh, Threatened Species Strategy Action Plan and inform future prioritisation of Myrtle Rust affected species. Um, within the next few months, information will also be published on the Charbag website for interested parties to access. In wrapping up, um, Charbag and Vegans again want to thank the Australian Government for providing the funding for the survey, uh, the National Myrtle Rust Working Group for their help in developing it, and all of the organisations and staff who took time to provide their valuable data for this survey. It, it will definitely come in handy. If you'd like to get in touch about this work, um, please feel free to contact us via the details on screen. Thanks for listening and Damien Wrigley and I are happy to take any questions about this work. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Bradley. And what a fantastic data set. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of people very keen to dig into that detail in future. <laughs> so uh, well done. Well done. And thanks again to all those um, uh, ex situ facilities that contributed data. I think that's so valuable. Um, I'm going to hand back over now to Cherie. So if today's presenters want to um, come back on screen, um, I'm very happy to take questions um, either from the chat or by people raising their hand. We do have some time available for that. Everyone's been very efficient in their speaking today. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, Cherie. No worries. Thank you. And thank you to all the presenters today. Um, it was, yeah, fantastic to see um, all the, yeah, lots of hard work going into um, into the project and collaboration um, among, across organisations. So um, has anyone got any questions? I've been keeping an eye on the chat and we've got some great um, websites that were put in the chat. So I think that answered one of the questions, but um, maybe just put your hand up and Anthony, if you want to unmute yourself and just uh, maybe ask. Yes, uh, can, do we know where this has originally come from? Yes, it's uh, South American in origin. Yes. Um, as I mentioned, there's several strains known to exist within South America and a few of which have got into North America as well. Um, we've only got one strain in Australia. Uh, so it's basically the uh, tropical and subtropical regions of Brazil and uh, Uruguay uh, are thought to be the native areas. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Stephanie? Hi, um, I apologise. I missed the first half now, so I apologise if this was already covered. Do you recommend any fungicide sprays, specifically brands um, that you know, best, most effective. I know that like there are, I, I'm pretty sure there are sprays specifically for myrtle rust, but they are a bit more, I guess, intense. You can use a general fungicide, but it might not completely treat. Um, I'm going to see if uh, my colleague at uh, 
um, the Australian Botanic Gardens Mount Anna Veronica Violet is online is happy to answer that. So um, there is a range of fungicides available and it's ideal if they're used in rotation. Are you happy to take that question, Veronica? Thanks. Actually, you pretty much answered it, Amelia. So yeah, there is a range of chemicals that um, are available for use and they do need to be used in rotation to avoid um, metal rust building up any resistance to them. And um, there's actually some really document, uh, really good documentation available covering that that we can send to you. Um, if you'd like to, maybe you could put your details in the chat and I can send them to you. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably the easiest way to do it rather than going into detail here. That's excellent. Okay, Thanks thank so you. much, Veronica. And we should also note, I'm not sure um, what state you're in, um, Stephanie, but each jurisdiction has um, slightly different um, regulations and permits, and they also are time-based as well. Um, so the National Working Group is aware that it's quite a complex situation um, and they'll be working to, to table that and progress that as an issue and see if there's a level of coordination that can be provided. But, yeah, certainly being in touch with um, people like Veronica who've been managing, the, managing these collections a long time is, um, is a great thing to do. Um, I think Rob Stewart had his hand up. I think you're still on mute. You got me now? Yep, that's good. <laughs> My question is, um, we can control, I'm from Shalovan Edge Native Botanic Gardens on the south coast of New South Wales. We can c control myrtle rust within the garden, but we, you know, we've got a lot of bush around us. You know, you, that it's a constant, um, problem to control it when it's blown in from other areas so what's the answer for that you don't want to keep spraying your trees constantly with fungicides are you talking there rob about um some of these species that are particularly endangered or mertosi in general it's just mertosi in general yeah like we've had it in our nursery We've sprayed, we've had it on uh, Syzygium resilience hedges pretty bad. Um, but uh, yeah, it, we can spray, but do you keep spraying the rest, the rest of your life? Like? The short answer, short answer is, is it depends on, on which species and how valuable they are to the overall conservation effort. Yeah. Some gardens have the accession, some uh, vulnerable species that aren't uh, of particular conservation value. Others are retaining those species, but are spraying uh, in order to preserve that genetic lineage. Yeah. Um, ANBG has had this sort of problem periodically as well. They've got a very large collection of Mertesi, not all of which have contracted myrtle rust during their episodes. But Zoe, I wonder if you might have something on this. I'd have to defer to our HORT team, Bob, and ask for the expertise there. Sorry, because we, since I've been here, haven't. Okay. Um, haven't had any. Sorry to put you on the spot. There. No, no, it's um, fine. Yeah, so look, it, it depends what you've got, Rob, and and how badly you want to keep it. But uh, please give consideration if you are deciding to deaccession anything or discontinue maintenance of anything. How valuable is it in the overall conservation scheme of things, uh, both in relation to myrtle rust and more generally? Uh, because um, rescuing germplasm that you've got but feel you can no longer uh, maintain uh, might be part of the actions that need to be taken. Yep. We have got a, quite a collection of threatened species and vulnerable plants in the gardens that, you know, we're keeping a close eye on them. Yeah. yeah. It's a tricky one, but look, please, please feel free to stay in touch with anybody on the, on the, the working group yep. um, uh, over time. And it may be worth... I mean, it's, it's annoying, it's expensive, uh, it's time consuming, but it may well be worth uh, continuing to spray um, uh, periodically yep. when you get an outbreak. No worries. Thank you. And Veronica, did you want to add uh, something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, I did say, look at Oh, sorry, someone's speaking. Yeah, conditions on the East Coast have been particularly bad for probably the last three years with La Nina, but hopefully that's going to change very soon and we should have drier conditions. 
So hopefully that will reduce your need to spray. Um, I understand that things have been really bad and that's been the case for quite a while, but hopefully in, in the coming year, um, things should improve and you may be able to spray less. Yeah, we've had the last couple of years, have had quite high humidity, which yes. hasn't helped. And high rainfall, and that's and been pretty much three yeah. solid years. Yeah. Yep. yep, no worries. Thank you. I'll just add briefly to that, for those gardens that are holding um, um, some of the lineages in these catastrophically declining species, it's not necessarily an obstacle to doing that, to be in the middle rust zone. Um, after all, if we shifted everything out to Alice Springs or whatever, um, it's subject to a whole bunch of different pressures and it's not a conducive environment for those particular plants. So Lismore's bang in the middle of the zone and um, part of the price of them maintaining uh, these valuable lineages is to um, use chemical. Um, I'd like to mention also Booderie Botanic Gardens, which was actually uh, the first um, uh, gardens to um, um, sort of pull their finger out and go out, go out gathering Rhodamnia rubescens uh, from their local populations, which went extinct shortly afterwards. Um, and so they're on the south coast too, of course, and they're um, they're maintaining those those lineages uh, with periodic spraying when necessary. Um, but that's not all the time. But good on you, Buderi. Uh, there was a couple of questions in the chat. So um, has there been any consideration to the conservation of microbial communities that co-evolved with these plant species? Yeah, bloody good question. Um, not a lot in Australia so far, but uh, everybody I think is aware of it or everybody involved is aware of it. There's more work going on on this in New Zealand and uh, there was um, a very interesting uh, paper published over there recently uh, for um, uh, a survey of um, microfauna and microfungi on uh, a couple of their myrtle rust affected species in Lophomyrtus, the genus Lophomyrtus, and came up with, I think it was, it was 299 um, uh, epiphytic uh, fungi and, and plants of lower plants of one sort or another. Um, on on the uh, the three taxa that they examined, so there is a big community just of uh, epiphytes in those two groups. There's microfauna to be considered, uh, and there's endophytes, the uh, the microorganisms that actually grow inside the plant as well. Um, and I mean, whoever asked the question, uh, sorry, I haven't got that bit of the chat in front of me at the moment, um, will be well aware that um, we're a long way from having an adequate database on. Uh, those kind of um, microbial associates uh, in Australia. Uh, but um, replicating that New Zealand study for some of the species here uh, that are severely affected by myrtle rust would be, I think, a very valuable exercise. Thanks, um, Robert. Um, there was also one uh, about South Australia, which I've lost in the chat as well. Um, is I think they were mentioning, um, is myrtle rust over in South Australia or is it um, a bit of, more of a dry climate so it's not as prevalent? Uh, me again or somebody else? Okay. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, there's probably a few factors involved with South Australia. One is, yes, much of it is a drier climate. Uh, secondly, like Victoria and Tasmania, only even more so, it's probably got a lower number of highly susceptible species, at least in the, the wetter areas of the state. That's not to say there are none. Um, we've got things from inland Western Australia that are known to be highly susceptible. It's just that the uh, likelihood of they're getting exposed to motor rust except in cultivation is very, very low. South Australia does have a number of species which are kind of um, not officially, but in, in a kind of unofficial keep watch um, sort of zone at the moment. And it's probably got uh, theoretical susceptibility in most of its motosi as, as all states do. Uh, but um, being drier by and large, except in the southeast, is one factor. Uh, perhaps a lower number of the highly susceptibles that can build up a rapid spore load is a second factor. And the third one is the prevailing west to east weather patterns in Australia which uh, would have tended to keep it out of both South Australia and the southwest of WA. Thank you. 
Um, also, another one from Kim about um, she's in South Australia also. Um, she's not familiar with the native guava rhodomertus. Is, is this a keystone um, rainforest species and what fauna is dependent on this and the other species? It's not a keystone species, uh, nor is the shrub turpentine. Um, they're uh, common elements of the understory and they may be significant for those micro associates that we, we talked about earlier, uh, but they're not keystone. However, there are a couple of other rainforest species which at least in some ecosystems do perform an important building block role. Um, Archirhodomertus beckleri, for example, and Gossia hillii, both seem to uh, play a pretty key role in uh, rainforest regeneration, at least natural rainforest regeneration and spread uh, in far northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland, where they uh, help close the mid-storey uh, canopy uh, of a regenerating rainforest system, uh, providing the shade which allows um, uh, the, the sort of rainforest conditions to be maintained uh, down at ground level. Uh, and the loss of them is opening canopy uh, with the effects you might expect of, of uh, more sunlight and therefore more weed invasion and a different suite of floristics. Um, in the case of native guava, uh, there are no known macrofauna dependence on it. Uh, there's quite a number of things uh, feed on it, a large number of insects, but the flowers are adapted for generalist pollination. Uh, and it's likely that any insects um, visiting the flowers for nectar or pollen rewards are generalists as well. Leaf mites, we know nothing about um, uh, for these species. Uh, there may be obligate relationships there. Um, but uh, the one case where there is a real keystone role for a species that's being pretty hard hit by myrtle rust is broadleaf paperbark Meluca quinquinervia, which dominates a lot of freshwater wetland systems up and down the east coast and river margins, uh, plays a major role in shading those water systems and holding banks together and producing a lot of biomass for those wetlands. Uh, it's also a mass flowerer and anybody who's seen uh, a paperbark swamp in, in mass flower will be familiar with the number of birds and insects that do visit. Uh, and while they may not be wholly dependent on that species, uh, any reduction in flowering levels uh, is a major um, uh, sort of impact on their uh, both the connectivity of their habitat overall and on their uh, ability to uh, feed it in any particular summer. Thanks, uh, Robert, for answering those. I think um, uh, we've got most of the questions, although Rebecca, where can people find the Myrtle Rust Management Plan mentioned by Rowan? Did you post, did Rowan post that before on the chat, maybe further up the chat? <laughs> He's just, he just said that he'd followed the Myrtle Rust management plan from two 2013 to treat an outbreak in a trial in Melbourne and um, he, he successfully followed it. So I just thought it might be useful for other people if it's yeah. still. Yeah, he's oh. just posted, he'll find, he'll find it. Great, great. Right. For us. Um, I just had, I think, Veronica, Pop your hand up again. I was just going to say that that plan's readily available online, um, but as Amelia mentioned earlier, there may be different uh, rules for different states. So it's important to check what's uh, relevant for your particular state. Um, and that particular document was put together by the industry body um, for New South Wales, the garden industry body and so each state will have their own body that should have that information available and relevant for your particular state and circumstances. Thanks Veronica. Um, Wendy was asking about um, is there a way to um, decontaminate clothing and tools or the best way? No. Veronica? Do you want me to take that as that one, Bob? Sure. Yeah, so it's the same kind of hygiene processes that you would use for any horticultural work or field work. 70% um, ethanol or methylated spirits. Um, 
the same kind of protocols apply you clean your tools you make sure your boots are clean your clothing is clean i mean ideally if you were to go into an area where myrtle rust is present um, it would be good if you could remove the outer layers of your clothing when you leave before you go to a different area um, this is very easy to transfer from place to place so really you want everything to be clean before you move to the next site um, or you make, if you're, if you were if, if, within a nursery environment, if I'm dealing with any, any active rust, that would be the last thing that I would do in the day. So try and sort of plan your work so that any contact with myrtle rust of any kind is the last thing that you do. And then all of your tools, your boots, your clothing, everything is cleaned before you go on to anything else. Does that that said, within the um, within the East Coast Myrtle Rust Zone, um, the the pathogen is now pretty ubiquitous because of its airborne nature. So local hygiene, daily hygiene of the sort that Veronica's outlined is still valuable for people who are practising in the horticulture area. Um, but it's particularly important if you're moving um, yourself or equipment uh, or um, goods of one sort or another from the East Coast Zone of occurrence of Myrtle Rust to areas of Australia or New Zealand where it's not currently present. Um, so, for example, if you were off on a jolly to um, uh, visit the southwest of WA on a collecting trip or to visit Kings Park or, or whatever it might be, um, the uh, decontamination of all your stuff uh, before you go uh, is really vital um, because you're going not only to those states, but you're going with a particular interest in uh, seeing plants, and that means that any spores you carry have a greater likelihood of uh, falling onto something which they can actually live on. Um, ordinary laundering of clothing uh, with a normal dishwashing, uh, sorry, dishwashing, uh, normal laundry detergent will uh, do the job. Uh, but these items of equipment like uh, rain capes and hats and, and camera cases and things of that sort, which do need the uh, the metho spray and which are often forgotten. Thank you. Thanks, um, Robert and Veronica. Um, I've still got Rob and Anthony with their hands up. Did you want to ask another question or? Might have just had get their hands up from before. Um, I think that might be all, unless um, anyone else has got any other questions. Amelia? <laughs> Yeah, I, I just have a question for, for Bradley, and hopefully I, I don't put you on the spot too much, um, given that this is a very large and new data set. Um, but in terms of uh, the collections um, of Rhodomyrtus, the species that we were speaking about earlier in the webinar, it looked like that action to distribute plants between a number of partner gardens fairly quickly increased um, you know, the number of collections in total distributed over places, even though they were starting with a level of collections at other gardens. Yeah, it would be really interesting to see if that was the case for um, for, for other species, you know, how, how much of this distribution and sharing is happening and as mm. an industry how, how we can support that to happen um, you know, safely and effectively uh, in, in kind of existing networks and collaborations. Yeah, that's a very good point, Amelia, and it's definitely something that I'd like to have a look at in the data because if we can use these as an example of amazing work that's been done, I think it only helps our cause. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I'd, mm. I'd add to that that um, myrtle rust is symptomatic of a general trend um, in conservation need, which is that with increasing human impacts through climate, through greater transmission of pathogens and pests between continents and things of that sort, more and more we are unfortunately going to have to engage in highly interventionist forms of conservation like this one, not for everything, but for some things. And our capacities um, to assess what's needed and to do the research are very good. Uh, but our capacities within the botanic gardens and, and horticultural, scientific horticulture areas are still well below where they need to be, even for the pests and pathogens we've got at the moment. Uh, and with increasing pressures through uh, of um, ordinary, if you like, uh, threatened species, uh, which many gardens are engaged with, 
um, uh, the the addition of sort of um, uh, particular high loads of, of material like from myrtle rust uh, threats is um, very rapidly maxes out uh, capabilities. So there's two ways of addressing that. One is that we get used to speaking with the united voice to uh, the powers that be, um, both government and non-government, uh, for the need for more resources if we are to safeguard our natural heritage. And the other one is in the meantime to work more and more cooperatively among ourselves uh, to share resources and expertise and um, make room around the edges to all the other things we're doing. Another case is the tropical mountaintops um, uh, collaboration, for example, which um, is dealing with stuff that's got nowhere to go with climate change from North Queensland. So this type of conservation is going to be a growing trend. I hate to say it provides a wonderful opportunity for botanic gardens because it's, it's an opportunity we would much rather not have, uh, but that is the reality. That's a great note to be wrapping up on, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. Um, some great questions and um, discussions too at the end. Um, is there any more any more questions from anyone? If they'd like to just quickly put their hand up. I think we've got a little bit more time. Otherwise, we might um, leave it there and um, we'll uh, make the recording available later for um, anyone who wants to catch up or, or missed out. So thank you um, again to everyone for coming along and thank you to our presenters. It was, yeah, fantastic. So thanks very much. Um, and we'll leave it there. <laughs>